Today's presentation is titled, The Future of the Failure to Warn Claim. I'm Heather Thompson, Internet Marketing Manager at Medmark. On behalf of Medmark and today's presenter, Randall Christian, thank you for joining us. Randall Christian is an established product liability trial attorney who focuses his trial practice on the defense of pharmaceutical and medical device manufacturers throughout the United States. He is and has been trial counsel for pharmaceutical and medical device cases in seven different states. Most recently, Randy served as first chair in a four-month bellwether trial in Southern California for a major medical device company. He also tried to a defense verdict the first bellwether trial in the country involving hormone replacement therapy as part of the federal MDL proceedings in Little Rock, Arkansas. With almost 25 years of experience, Randy's pharmaceutical, mass tort, and medical device product liability experience is vast and includes the defense of biophosphonates, diabetes medications, antihypertensives, hormone replacement therapy, breast implants, Norplant contraceptives, diet drugs, vaccines, and several, several ophthalmic products. His knowledge and experience includes Daubert motions, preparing company employees and experts for deposition, deposing experts, and recruiting and developing testifying experts in national pharmaceutical litigation. In addition, Randy has recent and substantial experience in conducting litigation risk assessments for companies preparing to market new products and marketed products where litigation is anticipated. Finally, Randy also defends pharmaceutical companies in government enforcement actions alleging Medicaid fraud and has significant experience defending companies sued under the Texas Medicaid Fraud Prevention Act. Randy has been recognized by the Legal 500 in product liability and mass tort defense, medical device and pharmaceutical category for his outstanding work in these areas. Additionally, Randy has recognized as a life science star by LMG Life Sciences in 2012 to 2015. A competitive athlete outside of the courtroom, Randy is a finisher of the 2007 Ironman Triathlon, qualified for the 2009 Half Max Triathlon National Championship, and recently finished in the top 8% of the Chicago Marathon which provided him with qualifying time for the Boston Marathon. Randy was nominated as Austin's fittest lawyer in 2012. With that, I'm pleased to turn things over to Randy, who will begin today's presentation. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, this is Randy Christian, and thanks for joining us here for the future of the failure to warn claim. When my uh, two children asked me when I'm sitting down on the couch at night reading through a prescribing information or product warnings, you know, what my job entails, uh, I tell them I'm basically looking through a document that doctors never read, patients never read, but that I spend most of my career arguing about what words are in there, what words should have been there, and what words were not in there. Uh, but seriously, uh, you know, as in failure to warn claims, we spend a lot of time evaluating our clients' drug warnings and device warnings evaluating what our clients knew or should have known about the drug risk, and asking prescribing physicians and implanting physicians whether a different warning would have changed their prescribing decisions. I'm always interested in kind of staying on top of what's happening in this field of warnings, and there's been quite a few significant developments over the last couple of years, and that's what I'm going to try to share with you today and talk a little bit about how that might impact the defense of the learned intermediary doctrine. Uh, just to kind of give you an overview, I, when I started to look at this topic, I wanted to kind of get a sense of where medicine in itself is headed in the future. And a couple of books that I recommend that I read to learn more about the future of medicine uh, on the first one is, is a fictional book called The Cell by Robin Cook, where uh, basically a large insurance company turns your iPhone into uh, an application called iDoc. And it's a smartphone that functions as your personalized primary care physician uh, by uh, using a convergence of the internet, mobile phone technology, quantum cloud computing, social networking, digital medical genomics, wireless biosensors, and advanced imaging. And it's pretty interesting uh, to see how this worked and that people have their own personal doctor that was available to them 
that could diagnose them with several different medical conditions and kind of cutting out the doctor altogether. And then when I turn to the, the non-fictional book by Eric Topol, who's is a, a big writer in this area of the future of medicine, uh, he discusses in this book, the patient will see you now, not only the availability of technology to patients and the availability of information about drugs and different medical devices and how that's changing the relationship between the patient and the doctor with the patient becoming more empowered with their knowledge. And what was interesting in, in uh, Topol's book was that he actually references this book by The Cell by Robin Cook and says that all the technology that he discusses in that book is actually available today. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And as we mentioned, there's biosensors now that can connect to your smartphone. They can measure blood pressure, cardiac output, body temperature, pulse, respiration, just about everything you would need uh, for a complete checkup. So we're going to really continue to see a big change, I think, in the medical field as a whole. And I think the idea of going to a doctor's office is going to start to feel a little bit more foreign. Uh, one big insurance company, uh, Oscar Insurance, actually is implementing some of this technology by allowing you to get a diagnosis uh, from a doctor over your, your cell phone by for little minor things uh, like a skin rash or something like that. You can actually take a picture and get it uh, evaluated by a doctor. So we're already starting to see some infiltration of this technology. So kind of coming back to what I'm really focusing on, and that is going to be the the FDA's recent initiatives in focusing on communication of drug risk directly to patients. Um, and then secondly, uh, some innovative methods that have that have come up recently to convey drug risk information. And then finally, we're going to end on what some of this might have a potential impact on the learned intermediary doctrine. A quick history of drug warnings, you know, uh, not a lot has changed. Uh, sorry you can't see some of these. Uh, they were supposed to come up individually, but uh, for instance, what we used to see back in the early 1900s, this little blue thing was uh, a syrup that you could give to your children. It said it's very soothing for children. Turns out that uh, the reason why it was so soothing is because it had morphine in it. It led to, to many deaths around the country. Uh, you see a copy here of the PDR. The very first physician's desk reference came out in 1947. Uh, it, it listed out uh, in a text-based method uh, the indications and warnings for different drugs, and that has not really changed over time up until now. We still convey drug risk primarily through a text-based method. Then in the 1970s, we saw the first set of patient package inserts that were information and with warnings that were written and distributed for users of oral contraceptives and estrogen-containing products that went directly to women that would be using those drugs. And then in uh, 1997, the FDA set out its draft guidance to begin to allow direct-to-consumer advertising of drugs, which allowed for widespread advertising and prescription drugs. And then with medication guides, those first came out in early 2000 after the final rule came out in late 1999, uh, which is, you know, a document that is required to be provided directly to the patient when they are dispensed with the medication. And then, of course, people recognize the little clip-ons to the bags when you go pick up your medication for the pharmacy. These are consumer medication information brochures or monographs that have been out since the 1990s. And then what I'm going to focus on now is uh, in 2007, with the uh, passing of the Food and Drug Administration Act, the FDAAA, it established the FDA's authority to require RIMS, or Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategies, for prescription drugs when the FDA determines that a strategy is necessary to ensure that the benefits of the drug outweigh its risk. Uh, so that was a new tool that the FDA had in 2007 
and we're really seeing an explosion in the area of REMS. I, for instance, from the FDA, I get updates when they add a new REMS policy for a drug or make a change to one, and those come in rapidly filling up my inboxes as we see more and more REMS being associated with approved prescription drug products. But I want to focus on uh, the patient counseling part of REMS. Uh, there are several parts of the REMS program that focuses on patient counseling, and that's something that the FDA has focused on uh, extensively since 2012. One of the things that they have are called counseling tools that can be part of a REMS program where uh, there's a material that's put together. Uh, it's provided to physicians that they can use in counseling uh, information about the benefits and the risk of the drug to the patients. We have the medication guides that, uh, that I already mentioned uh, that are part of several REMS programs. In fact, you can see here that uh, as of just very recently, there have been over 200 prescription drugs that are accompanied with a medication guide. And I think that we're going to continue to see the growth in this area and for more commonly prescribed drugs and drugs with significant risk attached to them. I think most, mostly all of them will have medication guides as we go forward. So when the FDA began to focus in on what risk information looked like going to patients, of course, one of the things they would look at would be medication guides. And one of the things that was available to them was this 2012 study where these authors of the study did a research where they looked at the readability of 185 different medication guides that were available. They ended up determining that while medication guides are supposed to be written at the 6th to 8th grade level, that the mean reading level, the ones that they studied, was 10 to 11th grade, uh, they found very poor comprehension of these medication guides, that they were too complex and difficult to understand. And out of all 185 medication guides, their conclusion was that only one of them was found suitable for readability. So this is what the FDA was, was faced with when in 2012, the FDASIA, or the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, came out. And one of the elements of FDASIA was it instructed the FDA to have several priority projects. And priority project number one was to look at the providing of benefit and risk information directly to patients. And one purpose of what they were going to look in this area was to see if there was ways that you could improve the communication of the risk-benefit profile to patients. And what the FDA decided to do was they were going to, that was what they were told to do in 2012. In 2014, they sent out this report talking about their plan, and part of their plan in looking at patient counseling materials was to conduct some research into patient counseling tools and to look at ways that the way that we communicate risk directly to patients can be improved. So they began doing that, and last year, uh, in talking with uh, the FDA, they teamed up with an outside company that was reevaluating their REMS program. And it was the company that was uh, involved with the prescription drug Prolia, Prolia is a medication that is prescribed by doctors for the treatment and prevention of osteoporosis. It's a bone-strengthening drug. And what they did was uh, they teamed up with the company and with doctors, and when patients came in that were going to be an appropriate candidate for the drug Prolia, the doctors uh, randomly changed up the way that they described the drug risk to the patients, uh, particularly some of the risk associated with the drug of osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is dead, 
jawbone, uh, atypical from all fractures and serious infections. And what the doctors with some group of patients would do the traditional method where they would talk about the risk and show the risk with the written text. The other half of the group of patients were actually shown some graphic uh, images of some of the side effects that accompany the drug in addition to being talked about the risk uh, in a text format and it verbally with the, with the doctor. When the patients left the doctor's office, a social scientist was there and would ask them questions about what, they, what their recall was about certain risk of the drug. And the results came back that the, the patients who had been shown these graphics of the different side effects had a much greater recall of those side effects associated with the drug compared to the patients who had only uh, seen a description of the, of the side effect in written format. So after that research was completed, the company sent in uh, an update to the REMS program, and, and it was updated their patient counseling toolkit, which contained, uh, among other things, a patient brochure. This patient brochure, which just came out uh, several months ago, uh, now includes uh, these graphic images that were used in the study. Here is you see a picture of a woman suffering from osteonecrosis of the jaw. You see that where the tooth is uh, no longer there, and underneath it there, the bone in the jaw has uh, become necrotic. They still, uh, of course, accompany with the traditional wording of the warning off, to, off next to the picture. Also with the, the same thing with the atypical femoral fracture or thigh bone fracture, they included these images. And these are the first uh, images that uh, we've become aware of in the, in the prescription drug setting uh, that is accompanied with materials to the patient uh, about a side effect directly affecting the person taking the drug. And then finally, you see uh, the skin rash issue, uh, which also included a picture. So this, uh, to me, was, was fairly significant. The only other thing that, in talking to the FDA, that we know is out there that we saw was on a website for Sabril. Sabril, which is an anti-epileptic prescription drug, was an in indication for infantile spasms. And the FDA and the drug company knew that one of the side effects is the possibility of permanent vision loss, especially of the peripheral vision. And the FDA said they realized that that would be very difficult to describe in wording, so and not an easy concept to communicate. So they allowed to work with the company to put a pictorial presentation of what it, losing your peripheral vision might look like. And so that's on the website for Sabril. Now, some of you may recall that, uh, that you have seen images before, and that is true. An exception to this uh, are images to discourage pregnancy and drugs that pose a risk of birth defect. And some of these have been around for a long time, uh, and that's something that uh, we continue to see. But with the Perlia drug was the first time we're seeing uh, images of side effects directly to the patient taking the drug. I'm going to come back to that one. On the medical device side, uh, something that I saw that recently got coming into effect is a final rule in September of this year, which is going to allow uh, for graphics and symbols to be used on medical device labels uh, stand alone without any accompanying text. You know, traditionally, the FDA would not allow any symbols without explanatory English text. Uh, but this rule is going to allow those. That the FDA wanted to harmonize U.S. standards with European standards to use some symbols um, to make things easier so you don't have to uh, translate all the different accompanying uh, text with a symbol. And you can see 
Here's an example of some of the symbols that they are going to allow without accompanying text. And you got some that deal with risk information, consulting instructions, and biological risk. Knowing that this was going to become a final rule, a group of social scientists did put together a study that just came out this year analyzing uh, what different healthcare providers understood about these different symbols. And you can see that uh, only uh, six of the symbols were successfully comprehended by the healthcare provider. So uh, there's going to continue to be some work that needs to be done in that area. So just to wrap up this FDA portion, and then we'll go on to the learned intermediary section. Uh, you know, the FDA is definitely based upon the priority project from the FIDASIA Act and is focusing on direct warnings to patients uh, based upon this research that they conducted with the company on using graphics to convey those risks. And knowing that the FDA uh, saw the results of those studies that women who saw the graphic images had a much better recall of them, we can anticipate starting to see this occur in more and more different products. So with this focus on communicating directly to the patient on drug risk, uh, does this have any potential to erode the learned intermediary doctrine? So let's talk about that now. Uh, Marcus Welby was kind of our original learned intermediary when I was a young kid. I think a lot of most of the young associates in my firm don't even, don't even know who that is anymore. But the basics of it are significantly for us lawyers defending pharmaceutical manufacturers and medical device companies are that we only have a duty to warn the physician and not a duty to warn the patient. Uh, so if we adequately warn the learned intermediary, we have not breached our duty. And if the learned intermediary is aware or has independent knowledge of that risk, that breaks the causal chain. It's a well-established doctrine in most jurisdictions across the country. It got its roots back in the, uh, all the way back into the 1940s. The phrase began appearing in the 1960s. It was really developed through the 70s and the 80s, which made sense during a time period when most people didn't have other options to learn about different drugs or medical conditions other than through their treating physician. The, the physician was basically the sole source of information about prescription products and uh, medical devices. We continue to see uh, in litigation attempts to weaken the doctrine. Of course, the plaintiff's bar would prefer to have a duty to directly warn uh, the patient instead of the learned intermediary. So there's consistent attacks, uh, including attacks on over-promotion of the drug, meaning such as marketing the drug for off-label usages. There's arguments that the learned intermediary doctrine should not apply in those situations. Uh, unconscious influence is one of the more interesting ones where uh, there's a claim that the doctor was so influenced by a manufacturer's publication of data regarding their products, uh, advertising, uh, use of different materials that were handed out by detail representatives such that they would prescribe the drug um, even though they didn't think that they were directly influenced. Physician compensation is one that's interesting. Uh, there was a recent Texas case where uh, the prescribing physician was participating as a clinical trial investigator and, of course, was paid for doing that, and the court found that that, that was an exception to the learned intermediary doctrine when the prescriber had been being paid by the manufacturer for conducting the clinical trial. But of course, the one that uh, gets most of the press and uh, is involved in most of the 
exceptions to the extent any of them still exist in the U.S. is the direct-to-consumer advertising exception, uh, which said that if a company undertakes advertising on TV or otherwise directly to patients, that you, then you've taken on your own duty to then provide adequate warnings directly to the patient. And we're going to get into a little bit more detail about that. And then a possible new argument when plaintiffs sketch on to all of this emphasis on focusing on warnings directly to patients by the FDA and by patient brochures that are used in REMS, we will start to see additional attacks on that. I wanted to hit a couple of the, the main exceptions to the learned intermediary doctrine uh, that have been the direct-to-consumer advertising, but I don't want to focus on the actual direct-to-consumer advertising, but looking at these main cases I went back and looked at some of the language in there to see if it would support uh, other theories for getting rid of the learned intermediary doctrine other than the fact that the company undertakes direct-to-consumer advertising. And this is, of course, the uh, Supreme Court opinion in 1999 out of New Jersey, the Perez case, that citing to direct-to-consumer advertising uh, limited the learned intermediary doctrine in the context uh, where there was an exception when there was direct-to-consumer advertising in the case. Uh, but if you look here, uh, one of the things that they talked about in that case, in addition to direct-to-consumer advertising, was the fact that with managed care, the doctors have such less time to spend with patients Uh and with such short visits with patients, uh, you may have not sufficient time to discuss the, appropriately the benefits and the risk of the drug. And a recent statistic that I just came across was the, for the average wait time for doctors' visits was 62 minutes, an average doctor visit only being seven minutes. So you can see uh, someone could pair that language with these statistics and come up with some good arguments that there's really not enough time in today's current situation for a doctor to adequately go through the risk of the drug. That uh, law still stands in New Jersey, but in the West Virginia, another big state, which did have an exception, or actually they just completely uh, altogether got abolished the learned intermediary doctrine in the Carl case in 2007, based upon direct-to-consumer advertising, but looking at some of the language, they said that the justifications for it are outdated and unpersuasive. And here's where they start to reference this fact that patients now have at their fingertips lots of different information. Uh, the development of the Internet as a common method of dispensing and obtaining prescription drug information was one of the things they listed in the decision. Uh, a recent update, if you haven't heard yet, uh, the West Virginia legislature passed a law which went into effect just a couple of months ago where they fully adopted the learned, learned immunity doctrine as a defense in all cases based upon claims of inadequate warnings for prescription drugs or medical devices. So that's, that's a good news for the learned immunity doctrine is that it now uh, exist in West Virginia, and over that was overturned this Carl case. We saw uh, back in 2015 in the learned intermediate world, we were closely watching this intermediate court of appeals in Arizona, which had found a direct-to-consumer advertising exception. And looking at some of the wording that they use, they, again, they discuss the fact that you have Internet sites and medical databases that provide a lot of information to consumers. And they recognized that the physician, while it used to be in the 60s and 70s, is no longer a the consumer's sole source of information about the effects and benefits and risk of the medication he or she takes. Uh, of course, uh, the update to this is that the Arizona Supreme Court uh, rejected this decision, um, overturned it, and the learned intermediary doctrine still applies without exception in Arizona. 
So while it is true uh, that today's world that our patients who go to see a doctor or get a prescription drug have many sources of information available to them, doesn't mean that uh, you know all that information is of the same quality. And we believe that it's still the fact that uh, the doctor is still the best source of information, even though the doctor is not the sole source of information, it is still the best source of information, and it still makes sense, as we see in this decision from the Fifth Circuit in 1974, that the learned intermediary should apply, really because the prescribing physician not only can know about the propensities of the drug, the benefits and the risk, but they can then combine that with what they know about the susceptibilities of the patient, uh, understanding the patient's medical history and the characteristics of the patient. So it still makes a lot of sense for courts to maintain the learned intermediary doctrine. And then you might say, well, why are you citing to a 1974 decision? Well, this language has been cited over and over again multiple times uh, in decisions upholding the learned intermediary doctrine uh, even up until very recently. So the, the current state of play of the learned intermediary doctrine is that certainly the demise is not imminent as some plaintiff's lawyers would have you try to believe. Uh, in fact, you might even say that there's been a renaissance with the uh, West Virginia legislature reinstituting the learned intermediary doctrine, the Arizona Supreme Court overturning the Intermediate Court of Appeals uh, to where we now have uh, it followed in most jurisdictions across the United States. But we can anticipate that the plaintiffs will continue to try to chip away at this doctrine because they don't like it. And we need to be aware of whether or not the FDA's ongoing focus on this direct communication of risk to patients may provide some ammunition for the attorneys. So just to, to kind of end with a few practice pointers uh, to help us keep the learned intermediary doctrine in play. Uh, when you're taking physician and prescriber depositions, always continue to develop the different multiple sources of information that the doctor has uh, with respect to the drugs that they prescribe. And then most significantly, uh, getting the physician to discuss the fact that in making their prescribing decision that they relied heavily on their understanding the plaintiff's past medical history and their past treatment uh, of that particular patient in making a prescribing decision. Develop, you know, all potential sources of independent knowledge of the risk with the doctor apart from the prescribing information and drug warnings. Also, uh, a lot of these REMS materials that are prepared by companies and provided to doctors if you look at them standing alone, uh, appear to be something that maybe is just handed to a patient. But in practice, it is supposed to be something that the doctor pulls out and goes over with the patient at the same time. So if you establish that part of the process with the doctor, it is helpful in, in uh, showing that the doctor was involved in those discussions. And ultimately, no matter how much information is available to the patient, no matter how much they beg for a drug based upon a TV commercial, it's ultimately the doctor's decision in weighing the benefits and the risk of the medication. We might begin to see some uh, experts that might can rely on some of these patient counseling materials um, as far as talking about warnings to patients. Uh, but again, make sure that you have the underlying REMS plans that your clients send to the FDA, which talk about the patient counseling materials being done in conjunction with the healthcare provider, not as a standalone piece. Uh, in plaintiff depositions, uh, try to always get the concession that they relied or primarily relied on the doctor on whether and how to take the medication. Make sure you get a copy of all counseling materials if they are part of a REMS program with patient counseling materials. Also, a lot of times we see now plaintiffs just say, well, I, 
are relied upon some TV ad in general. And it's important that you have a good understanding of the advertising history of your product and be prepared to ask very specific questions in the deposition uh, to help you narrow down if they really did see a TV ad and which one it was. So uh, kind of got through that pretty rapidly. Uh, it's weird when you just only hear yourself talking. But in conclusion, uh, you know we're we're seeing this REMS explosion uh, since 2007. I think we're going to continue to see it. We're going to continue to see more and more patient counseling materials. What to expect from the FDA? I think they're continuing to do their research. They have not issued their report. They are required to do from the 2012 FIDASIA Act uh, on this research that they're doing on the directly communicating risk to patients. Uh, we need to be continue to be alert to potential threats to the learned intermediary doctrine and do our best to keep preserving that defense. And uh, always argue for the fact that uh, ultimately it's the doctor that prescribes the medication and they're the ones that need to comprehensively weigh the risks and the benefits of the drug for the patient. So I think that's it. I appreciate everybody's time. Thank you, Randy. Uh, we're now going to proceed with the Q&A session. Uh, if you have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A panel located at the bottom right of your screen. And we have had some questions come in um, during the session. So first one we have, if a drug has a medication guide, does that mean it has a REM? Not anymore. Uh, in 2011, it used to be that if you had a medication guide before 2011, it was part of a REMS program. Uh, after 2011, the FDA separated medication guides out from the REMS process so that you can have a product with a medication guide that does not necessarily have a separate REMS program. Okay. Um, and this is a two-part question. Isn't judging the adequacy of how effectively pictures communicate a given warning subjective? And if so, will juries make that kind of determination? Well, I think it is subjective and it'll be interesting to to see, I mean, uh, there's always problems with this social science research. Uh, I don't know how many patients that the research included, uh, but I understand there was a fairly overwhelming difference in recall on the risk between uh, the patients who actually saw the graphics and the ones that did not. And I think with the FDA's understanding of that conclusion, I think there's probably going to be more ongoing research that will support that and similar research that we'll see with other drugs. And I really start, I believe that we'll start to see more and more infiltration of, of graphics for warnings and we may, you know, end up seeing them in medication guides eventually. Okay. Um, are there other drug products that have used graphics in patient information? The only ones that, uh, in talking with the FDA, it was the Prolia pro product, uh, with their patient counseling brochure, and then with the Sabral uh, online uh, picture of the loss of periphery vision. And uh, if anybody ever comes across any other ones, if you send me an email, I'm trying to keep up with this. Um, I know at a big presentation of of hundreds of lawyers where I talked a little bit about this a couple months ago, uh, no, one had, uh, no one else has seen anything else as of yet, but I think we're going to start to see it. Okay. And then this is the last one here. As a maker of a prescription product, is our knowledge that doctors aren't doing a good job of communicating warnings detrimental to us? And does this impose some additional responsibility to warn patients directly? I missed the very first part of it. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be a little louder. As a, as a maker of a prescription product, is our knowledge that doctors aren't doing a good job of communicating warnings detrimental to us? And does it impose some additional responsibility to warn patients directly? I don't think so. I would argue that, you know, our duty still just runs to the doctor. And if the doctor's not doing a good job of 
informed consent with the patient, and that's you know different cause of action of the patient may have against the doctor. Um, there are some there are become some issues about you know with manufacturers if they have the knowledge that doctors are unable to fulfill their role uh, as a learned intermediary. And one thing that comes to mind, you know, is the mass immunization exception learned intermediary doctrine where people would line up to get a vaccine. And in that situation, uh, judges said, well, we, we know companies know that they can't rely upon the learned intermediary in that situation uh, to be able to give proper risk of the drug, and so there you had to warn directly to the patients in the mass immunization setting. Mm-hmm. And so you can see people uh, make an analogy to that where if, if we get to a point where we know all doctor visits are, you know, five minutes long, I could see arguments where people will say the manufacturers understand that the doctor cannot fulfill that role, and so the manufacturer should have an obligation to warn the patient directly. Okay. And and we did have one additional question come in, so since we have some time, how do these changes, trends, affect generic pharmaceutical manufacturers and their duty to warn? Well, they will obviously, um, you know, if if there's, if we especially adopt the graphics in, you know, medication guides eventually, then, you know, generics are going to have to uh, follow the same, same labeling with their drugs, so... Uh, I think generic companies uh, should be alert to this also. 